My name is Hacker, Harry the Hacker, and I'm always on the lookout for a nice, easy golf course to mangle. So I was out driving through the alfalfa ranches around Lancaster, California, and I suddenly hit the brakes and backed up to read a sign. It said, Rancho Sierra Golf Club. And it was the prettiest little nine-hole layout you'd ever expect to see. The sign didn't say members only, so I went on in. Well, while I was tying my shoes, I met the owners, Jack Racinger and his wife Arlene, and Sam Fogo and his wife Doris. And then I made a mistake. I said that it must have been a cinch to build a golf course out here where it's so nice and flat. Well, it turned out that these people didn't buy this course or even contract to have it built. They themselves built it. It seemed that it all started in June of 1961 when Sam and Doris were vacationing in California with Jack and Arlene. Here were a couple of sisters and their husbands who had a common ambition. They wanted to build and operate a golf course, probably the most uncommon ambition any set of in-laws ever shared. So when that vacation was over, it was really over. Sam and Doris returned to Detroit and researched the technical aspect of golf course design, and Jack and Arlene went shopping for a scarce commodity, California real estate. At both ends of the line, they talked with golf course superintendents, managers, owners, and greens experts, learning all they could on the subject of golf courses. They found the property, an alfalfa farm on 40 acres, six miles east of Lancaster, and not too far from Edwards Air Force Base. There was plenty of golfing interest and few places to play, they told me. Then, I made another mistake. I asked if they uh, had any pictures. Oh, yes, they had pictures. They had plenty of them. Here was the old farmhouse taken from about where I had seen the Rancho Sierra sign on the road. And here was a closer view. And here was another shot taken from the side. They didn't see this as a farmhouse, probably least of all as their home for the next couple of years, but as a combination clubhouse, pro shop, and a starter's window. They had more pictures. Here was the farmhouse with an outside shower. The farmhands lived here. And here was the barn. And chicken coops, rabbit hutches, a corral, a hog house, a hay barn. Well, golf is tough enough without hog houses and hay barns, so they had to come down. With the help of an old friend, Bill Cagnus, they cleared the land, had it plowed, harrowed, and started laying out the course. Most of this was being done on weekends and vacations, and here it was, June already. Eight months since they had found the property. Well, something had to give. So, and General Motors had to give. After 25 years, Sam Fogo quit his job and moved to California, Doris following in November after selling their home in Detroit. The first thing he saw was the need to get wheels under the operation. And they bought a Corvair pickup and a nine-year-old tractor. Well, even a hacker like me knows that you can't play pasture pool on a pool table pasture. The course must have contour and definition. It must have elevated tees and greens. And it must fight back with fiendishly clever hazards like lakes and rivers, trees and tall grass, and of course, sand bunkers near the greens. Well, this means a lot of dirt moving, and that calls for a dump truck. Another Ford, uh, this one 10 years old with which they started excavating lakes. They picked the dirt up and they laid it down. They picked it up from the lakes, five cubic yards per load, and they laid it down on the tees and greens, calling for about 900 cubic yards. But that wasn't all. The greens had to be graded, and leveled, and raked, and raked, and raked. It was great work. Lots of fresh air and sunshine and solitude. No more production quotas to worry about. Or was there? Now, this green was nearly ready for its foundation layer of sand and peat moss, but uh, there were eight others to build. 
Sam decided to give this a good think. In his mind, he plotted an engineer's curve of money vs. manpower, dollars vs. days. And the answer was plain. They would have to contract for heavier equipment. Now the face of the golf course began taking shape faster. There were two of these earth movers and one pusher tractor. The earth movers bit into the soil like a spoon in a dish of ice cream, and when it was full, it would move off to dump its load while the other unit took its place. In the same way, two streams were dug connecting the lake, a portent of frustration to come when all losers like myself would invade the course. Now this is more what I had in mind, Sam said, as he operated the scraper doing final grating work around the big lake. When the lake was completed, they ran a pipeline back to the well on the property. The water table under Antelope Valley is high and the water is practically limitless. And Doris and Sam cooled their heels in the clear water, realizing that now they could begin the job of finishing the greens. Now Racinger and Fogo were out of the earth moving business and could concentrate on bringing in over 100 tons of sand for each green. The sand was leveled and the bunkers or sand traps were carved out. Now they had greens that weren't green, fairways that were plowed land, three large lakes waiting to work magic with this mineral rich desert soil. They rented a gasoline powered trencher and began the task of digging 14,000 feet of ditches for the sprinkler system. The work went fast with this machine. It dug a neat trench at the rate of three to five feet per minute. The manpower reserves were making their appearance regularly now, and Bob Johnson, Sam and Doris' friend from Detroit, saw a lot of action on that trencher. For the main lines, an asbestos cement pipe called Transite, four to eight inches in diameter, was used. On the heels of the trencher, the pipe laying crew installed the main lines first and then the laterals, two inch diameter plastic pipe. This was a critical operation calling for undivided attention and concentration on the job, which wasn't always easy with pretty photographers on one side and the energetic Bob Johnson on the other. The sprinkler system would operate on water pumped from the lakes at 1,000 gallons a minute through a pump powered by a 75 horsepower electric motor. And now that the lake was full, the moment of truth was at hand. And to Sam Fogo fell the honor of opening the valve that would flush the lines and send up geysers of water wherever there would be sprinkler heads. At first, they held their breath, and there was nothing but the sound of water filling the main lines. Then suddenly, like a castaway sighting a ship on an empty ocean, Lynn Racinger shouted and pointed. Bob Johnson sighted another. And Jack and Sam and nephew Rick pointed at water spouts one by one as they cleared the ground, first bubbling, then sputtering, then leaping with a beautiful whish sound to form junior grade old faithfuls all over the course. Springs in the desert is what it was like. And Arlene and daughter Donna had to go and touch and feel. And as I talked to this family and some of their friends who had participated, I saw that they were reliving that moment, and it was the genuine thrill of their lives as they looked and saw what they had done. They had brought lakes and rivers and fountains to this 40-acre square in the middle of this arid valley. And as they walked back to the old farmhouse, they found a few packages waiting for them. The peat moss had come. Now they could begin putting the foundations on the greens and they loaded up the peat boss. They delivered 100 bales to each green, cut them open, dumped them out, and spread them evenly over the entire surface. The next step was to rototill the surface in both directions until the peat moss and sand were thoroughly mixed. The peat moss would hold moisture and furnish a footing for the young grass, and the sand would ensure drainage. Where before they had to rake and rake and rake, now they had to drag and drag and drag. 
They used a large piece of chain link fencing and after finding that they couldn't use motorized equipment and unable to find a horse in this agricultural community, Sam and Bob simply had to substitute for the horse and put their backs into it. Does this picture remind you of Millais the Angelus? Well, it might have been a time for prayer at that, for it was the critical moment of planting the greens. And you can tell by the length of the shadows that this had to be done early in the morning or late in the evening when there was no breeze. Everyone took part in this occupation, sometimes pushing it into the evening by the light of headlamps. Each green received about 35 bags of these grass cuttings, which had to be immediately covered over with a mixture of sand and peat moss. Then in spite of naturally dry climate and lots of wind, these greens had to be kept moist, and it had to be done gently by hand. Sprinklers would have disturbed the surface too much. Given this ideal growing condition, the nodes of the grass cuttings could take root. Meanwhile, they planted the fairways using a cedar to broadcast a mixture of bluegrass, Bermuda, and fescues, and the green grass grew all around, all around. And this golf course, like any other baby, was in the most demanding period of its life. It was July, 1963, and they had already scheduled their grand opening for October. And then, from out of the sky came a setback. The alfalfa farmer adjoining the property had hired a crop duster to spray his alfalfa with diesel fuel to wither the leaves and make it easy to harvest the seed. The crop duster made a pass over one of the greens and the wind was just right and the precious grass suffered the same fate as the alfalfa next door. But they pulled it through the crisis and mailed out the invitations to the opening. And as these people looked at the announcement like a diploma or a presidential citation, they began thinking of the friends who had helped them. Besides the ones they had already told me about, they called the names of Arch Hagerman, Norm Hennis, Jack Smith, Stan Cleary, and Chet Payne, all of whom are friends of Jack's who work at Rocketdyne and have not yet learned to hate golf. Then there were the Militich team of Walt and his sons, Wally and Bruce. Bruce, seeing in this work a vocation possibility, stayed on three or four months full-time, but decided to finish his college education. Don McLeod and Ralph Shopman made themselves indispensable at times. So these people, plus Bill Kangas and Bob Johnson, whom I had already heard about, were people who made the word friend somehow have a little more meaning to me. Then there was the family. Jack's nephew Rick had spent his summer vacations working on the course. Younger brother Ken had helped a great deal with the sprinkler and peat moss business, as had older brother Dick, who came all the way from Anaheim. The parents were not to be left out either. Jack's father, Fred Racinger, was a great help in many ways. Sam's parents, John and Margaret Fogo, spent three to four months, several years, helping out. John made a contribution that could be measured in hundreds of dollars when he tore down and rebuilt the green moors probably one of the most expensive pieces of equipment on the golf course. And that beautifully designed fence I had seen as I drove in, that was built by John. And to top it all off, he made a gift of the Shopsmith woodworking equipment. And from Arlene and Doris' side of the family came Dad Weber and her brothers Bob from Portland, Ross from New Orleans, and Don from Detroit. Dad Weber, in his 70s, is a fixture now. He considers himself the pro for all the left-handed, good-looking girls and defends his title as gin rummy champ. And so finally, on Saturday, October the 12th, Rancho Sierra Golf Club was opened for business, and the course was in beautiful shape. It was a large crowd, interested almost as much in getting acquainted as in playing golf. The course its greens, its traps, and even its water hazards were enthusiastically received. And by the time they reached the second green, the players knew this course was no pushover. On the other hand, on March 28th, one of their favorite customers, a fellow named Sid Ney, made a hole in one. It was pure skill, too. Luck had nothing to do with it. Well. That cost the men's club a trophy. But speaking of trophies in the men's club, 
Persh Bliss, first president of the Rancho Sierra Men's Club, is ready to hand more to anyone who can earn them. Persh has done nothing but push the men's club until now it has over 165 members. Mrs. Bliss has done a comparable job of organizing the ladies' auxiliary. And all this had taken place in a year. And suddenly, it was anniversary day. It might have been a great time to shut up shop and go have themselves a ball, but Jack and Arlene Racinger and Sam and Doris Fogo said in their announcement, we can think of no better way to celebrate this occasion than to share it with our friends who have made it possible. And that's the way they feel about it. They know that once committed, they would somehow have finished their golf course, but they also know that without the physical and in some cases financial help of all these friends and family, the achievement would certainly have been delayed. A lot had happened in the year. The Fogos had long since burned their bridges in Detroit, and the Racingers, after Arlene quit her job at Lytton, and sold their lovely home in Canoga Park, and actually moved into that little farmhouse with their children and their in-laws under conditions of inconvenience and downright sacrifice. All for the sake of this beautiful golf course. And the women did a great deal more of the physical work on the golf course than the pictures showed. I found out that the main reason for this was that the women were usually taking the pictures. So now, it was anniversary time, and they were going to have a party. <laughs> Another Rocketdyne friend, Scott Webster, furnished the music. special tournaments and fun and food. On November 18th, it snowed. Now, this doesn't mean much to people in Detroit, but on the Rancho Sierra Golf Club in Lancaster, it was a real occasion. Roads were closed, school was out, and telephones were out, and the golf course was closed for a week. It was a time for fun, foolishness, and photography. And the Fogos and Racingers played snow games in an area where most of the school kids had never seen snow. But the men's club wanted to play snow games too. And so did the women's auxiliary. So Sam cleared the parking lot, part of the tees, and part of the greens. And using red painted balls, they teed off on one of the strangest golf tournaments I had ever heard of. The men's club had announced that the tournament prize would be a Thanksgiving turkey. Yeah, but who keeps score at a time like this? And as it turned out, they gave a turkey to everyone who showed up. Now began a period of major improvements. The parking lot was first. They did the grading, curbing, Black topping, 
surfacing and striping. And the promise of shade to come was seen in the landscaping. The landscaping for the course itself was the next major problem. From the Monrovia nursery, the largest nursery in the world, they bought 650 pines, cypress, redwood, magnolia, and other trees. And they placed them on the golf course in a plan that was both aesthetic and strategic. Trees were placed to shade the tees in the summer and expose them to the sun in the winter. I think Joyce Kilmer never played golf, or he could never have had such nice things to say about trees, or people who plan golf courses either, for that matter. These trees were laid out in such a way as to put dog legs in fairways that would otherwise offer a straight shot. And some of them, when they grow up, will make approach shots to the green more difficult every year. Challenging is the word Jack Racinger used. Well, it was during this tree planting period when they had an unexpected windfall from the course at Edwards Air Force Base. The Edwards course has a variety of clean cottonwood trees called Bomagillion. The Edwards superintendent gave Racinger and Fogo 250 limbs he had trimmed. Jack and Sam tapered these limbs and planted them. Instant trees is what they are. They are expected to reach 20 feet or so in the second year. The neighbors would certainly never recognize the old alfalfa field. Now they turned their attention to building a temporary pro shop around the existing farmhouse. Ken and Jack turned their hands to masonry as they finished the concrete slab. And soon the corner of the old farmhouse was surrounded by a glassed-in area where the golfers could enjoy sandwiches and beer while they argued over their scores. It was, in fact, the clubhouse. And tournaments were arranged like the two-day contest with the Trona Men's and Women's Club. Scotty Ross, the Trona manager, congratulated Sam and Doris on the occasion of the barbecue on Saturday night. And the old farmhouse rang with the sounds of sorrow and delight. His 19th hole post-mortems were said. Runner-up teams like Galen Reed and Chet Payne said, wait until tomorrow. And when tomorrow came, the tournament ended with a luncheon. Food and fun, fun and food. Yeah, I wish I'd been there. Sam and Jack recognize that there is still a great deal to do, like seating around the lakes. And it is all part of the plan, which includes a permanent, up-to-date clubhouse with all the facilities for comfort and pleasure expected of a first-rate golf club. And Rancho Sierra will provide for its enthusiastic customers the best course from tea to trap or lake, as the case may be, to green, where all that peat moss and sand and fertilizer is pushing up a firm but resilient and dependable putting surface. They introduced me to their superintendent, Mike McGee, and his brother, Alan, whose interest in bringing this golf course to life is something more than normal job enthusiasm. And they showed me the irrigation system in charge of Bill Latham, a man with an uncanny instinct for finding the irrigation risers concealed in the fairway grass. So I looked around at the facilities like the storage and workshop, the men's club room just off the first tee where the tablet of the law has been posted for all to see, the restrooms, the temporary pro shop, and the parking lot. And I think that they will get along very nicely until the new clubhouse is built sometime next year. With Arlene and Doris running the starting window with one hand while serving refreshments with the other. With Sam directing the activities of the golf course employees. With Jack merchandising a full line of golf goods and clothes as he runs the pro shop. And with their touring, teaching, terrific hitting PGA pro Pat Simmons trying to help hackers like me. This could be one of the best golf courses in this part of the country. Uh, once again, I said the wrong thing. I suggested that Jack and Sam must be glad it's all over. They would never have to go through this one again. Well, that's where I was wrong. To go through it again is exactly what they are planning. They feel they have learned a great deal which enabled them to make firm bids on at least two other new golf courses in the Southern California area. 
Well, as I pulled onto the road and left Jack and Arlene Racinger, Doris and Sam Fogo leaning on the fence the dad built, I said goodbye to those two fellas who have what it takes to climb out of a deep rut and achieve a new kind of life and livelihood. And perhaps even more, I marvel that they had wives and children who would take part wholeheartedly and with a minimum of complaint, living together in a tiny farmhouse in the middle of a flat valley, utterly remote by night, utterly without privacy by day. And as I took off, I heard them shout, Come back soon, Harry the Hacker. We'll be waiting for you. <laughs>